Good evening and welcome to episode 350 of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Uzamandunga Kumalo. If you're joining us for the first time, you have been missing out on incredible content and all things relating to property. Uh, we're on your screens every single weekday at 7 p.m. where I'm always in conversation with a property expert who helps us better navigate our property journey. We're counting down to episode 400. I think that's going to be December. So we're quite excited uh, behind the scenes to put together uh, a huge show for you. I think 400 is actually such a huge huge milestone, uh, especially for the tail end of the year. So that's definitely something that you must watch out for at home. And to all our regular viewers, welcome back. You know how we do it. Every single weekday, you and I have an appointment. Whether you're watching us on Facebook, on YouTube, or on Instagram, I would certainly want to hear from you. You can drop those green hearts down here below and the sign the register uh, this evening and as usual you know that we're running an incredible competition right here on the show where you stand a chance of walking away with 500 rands in cash and all you have to do is of course uh, comment on that post that we have on our facebook page and you stand a chance of walking away with 500 rands in cash the only catch, you need to be watching us live. So when we call your name, you drop us a text in order to claim your prize. We currently have 500 rands in the money bag. Yesterday's winner uh, did claim their prize. I think it was bonds or claimed that 1,000 rands that was in the money bag. So this evening, we're going to be giving away 500 rands. And of course, I do hope that you're going to be watching and we're able to claim that money. Uh, it is a Tuesday, so you can look forward to Umbali Noko bringing you the farming podcast later on this evening. And she's on your screens every Tuesdays and Thursdays uh, with the Farming Podcast, tackling all things agriculture. I know that they're kickstarting a really great Gardening 101 series. So that's some of what you can look forward to. If you're like myself, you've got green fingers and you're already growing something uh, you know, in your garden and want some tips and tricks on better handling uh, all things relating to your garden, then that is a show that you do not want to miss out on. And every Mondays and Fridays, Chad brings you the Home Shoppers Show, where he takes us through incredible tours of exquisite properties that you can find on www.privateproperty.co.za. And on Wednesday, Today is Esther Klassen brings you the first time home buyers show, where she's always in conversation with people who not only walked that first time home buying journey, but have gone on to grow their property 
portfolios from strength to strength. Well, those are the great shows that you can look forward to every single weekday at 8 p.m. Make sure that you follow us across our social media platforms on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, LinkedIn. We're also, of course, on TikTok. You can follow myself at Zamandunga underscore K on Instagram as well as on Twitter. Now, this evening, we're talking about something uh, that we don't usually talk about on the show because we always look at different parts uh, of what we're going to be exploring, but we rarely ever actually explore the big picture. And that is, of course, we're looking at ways to improve the property sector's value chain. And I think more often than not in the show, we deal with different parts of the value chain and helping uh, you at home to even understand how you fit in as a consumer and some of the things you need to know and how you can better manage uh, your how how you handle your property journey depending on who which player you are dealing with uh, in the value chain but we want to look at ways that we can improve the property value chain. I think far too often we, you know, we hear about instances where uh, there are certain issues and challenges uh, in, a, in a sector, and of course, some of those issues and challenges are not broadly in the sector, but they are sometimes at certain parts of the value chain. So, I really want to get a better understanding of you know ways we can improve it. But before we even start, there we're going to explore what do we even mean by value chain? How does the property uh, sector value chain, you know, look like? And also what does inclusion and, and equality look like in property sector value chain? And to help us get a big, good sense of how we can go about doing this and really understand it, given how we as consumers fit in uh, to the value chain. I'm joined this evening by Tessa Dooms, who is a director at Jasoro Consulting. Uh, Tessa, good evening and thank you so much for joining us. Good evening, Zama. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for having me. I think you know, just I think a, a really great starting point when we look at a topic like this before we even look at you know the, the granular details is when we talk about the property sector value chain what exactly are we referring to yeah so we're talking about um, a wide range of players in the sector um, that enable people to either um, be buyers sellers um, renters builders in the space um, people who are deriving um, value from property are supported by a wide range um, of both institutional and in some cases um, a fringe um, to, the, to the sector players who are trying to create enabling environments. Of course, enabling environments because um, they derive some value from um, the kind of support that they provide. Uh, but also because we recognize that this, the sector and, and a sector like property is much like the retail sector in the country, where um, it, it's a it's a staple. It's a staple. We forget that property is not a luxury. That it you know the um, one of the basic human rights, for instance, is the right to shelter. And much of the way in which we construct our societies is around the need for property. So it's one of those things that's never going away in terms of its need, and um, is something that is a fundamental part both of our economic growth as a collective um, in the country, on the continent, but also about our, the, the individual ways in which we live our lives economically, socially, and otherwise. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Tessa, I think one of the key things with our conversation this evening, uh, before we can even look at ways to improve the property sector's value chain, let's perhaps look at the factors that, uh, you, you know, come into play that leads to a successful value chain. Uh, because I think it's, it's one thing to, to want to look at areas of improvement, key factors um, that go, that certainly determine uh, the success of, a, of the property value chain. Yeah, I think one of the things that the sector um, relies on is um, big, stable institutions. Um, and maybe in some ways it's too reliant on them, But if we think about, for instance, the financing sector, um, banks and institutions that have um, large quantities of money and are able to um, engage in ways that that, um, secure lending for people is really a big fundamental part of it. So you need um, some level of security. Um, The second part of it is actually safety. And I think we forget often that um, both in terms of our financial safety, but even our physical safety, um, is a requirement for this um, sector and this value chain to work is we need to have checks and balances all the way through um, a property journey to ensure that there is um, safety um, in, in many parts um, of the process. And I think finally, um, there's, there's an element of, of relationships and trust. 
a lot of this sector's value chain is, is dependent on trusting people and building relationships with people. If you think about um, just the buying and selling of, of property, if you think about the building of property, uh, we have many, many horror stories of people who have terrible experiences because of um, bad actors in the space, um, selling things that they can't, um, hiding things when they do sell or buy, or constructing things in ways that um, are unethical and, and, um, and harmful. And so I think those, those are some of the, the more generic um, markers. And then, um, and maybe I'll add to that, um, just issues around knowledge and information. And one of the things about the sector that we do have to have a conversation about is who are the, the people who broker knowledge in the space? Because um, many people come to the property space um, as, as consumers as a once or twice in a lifetime engagement. They don't come in as something that an, an industry that they're going to engage with uh, you know, multiple times. So they don't have the learning arc um, that you might have with other industries that you engage with. And so in the short spurts that you are um, engaged with the industry, um, you need a lot of knowledge in order to make good decisions. And mm -hmm. often there are brokers of that information and that knowledge. There are people who, um, for whom it is in their best interest for particularly consumers to not have as much knowledge as possible. Um, and so knowledge is, I think, a key um, driver of success um, for, for the value chain, particularly for the customer experience. Mm, mm, mm. And, you know, Tess, I actually love that, that you, you mentioned that last bit around uh, the key role that knowledge, particularly for the consumer plays, and that there are, unfortunately, uh, certain stakeholders within the value chain who would much rather... Uh, you know, consumers at home don't know about because then it's easier for them to uh, make the sale and, and certainly be able to extract whatever funds they were able or wanted to extract from, you know, people at home. And I think the other two things, of course, trust and relationship is something that always gets echoed uh, throughout the show that property is, is not a solo thing. Uh, and often people who started off even from, a, you know, an investment perspective, who started off doing it by themselves, realize that there's a ceiling that you reach when you, you know, started off by yourself and when you really want to grow and, and scale, you have to, at some point, go at it with people. There are so many different people that you need to uh, form relationships with um, as much as possible. And I think speaking of that relationship, of course, the viewers at home are very used to the family that we have created here, where they're able to get their daily dose of property knowledge and uh, able, of, uh, able, of course, to also uh, certainly ask us various questions that can better enable them uh, to make better property decisions. And I already see some of the love that we're seeing on our Facebook page Page from you at home, Andre Pitot, uh, Oliver Gavinder, uh, Paulina Ngosi, Justin Bartman, Eyetu uh, Maeki, so uh, uh, watching, and Menzi Butelezi saying that bond pro protection is a big value add in, in, in property value chain. And that is quite a big one. I think some people uh, actually was in the meeting just today who don't, who don't know about you know, bond cover and bond protection. And, and sometimes, and I think if anything, that's a sale opportunity for somebody that can they can explain it quite well and it certainly has its benefits and and i think i i want to find out from you know people at home if where in their property journey that did you have you know issues with what, what did you struggle with along in your property journey especially because you know that there are all these different steps um even when you're a tenant you know there are different steps before you even move into a place and by the time you move out and if you're looking to buy there are various steps if you're looking to sell what have been some of the pressure points um along your property journey and perhaps who were some of the culprits that uh were i'll say were the reason why you experienced that pressure point i know that for many of of us who are you know homeowners might say perhaps contractors are a big pressure point uh, there's only some or other thing that needs to be done and we think i feel like everybody has a as a contractor for a story so do share with us down below some of your experience with you know what have been the pressure points throughout your property journey and and tessa you know speaking of the the pressure points what would you then say have been some of the challenges when it comes to you know, the property sector's value chain that um, we're still currently facing I think it's there's so it, I feel like challenges are just a moving part. What would you say are some of the key challenges um, that the sector faces? 
Yeah, I would say for me, one of the biggest challenges is financing. And um, for two reasons. One is that there seems to be um, a limited market for financing. And um, two, it's a very opaque process. You don't really understand, for instance, what um, the, the vetting process actually looks like and how you present yourself to a, um, a financier, um, what works in your favor and what doesn't. People kind of blindly just produce documentation, loads of documentation, um, and then hope for the best. But there's not really a clear explanation about, for instance, if you're unsuccessful, what are the things that made you unsuccessful and what are the things that could make you unsuccessful? I remember in my own um, just most recent property experience when I was selling a home and buying, um, looking to buy a new one. A year before I actually made the decision, I, I, I thought, let me be a proactive consumer. Let me call the bank. Let me find out what my status is. And no one was able to help me even just think, think through conceptually what would make me a good um, what would make me a good prospective mm -hmm. um, client of the bank or what wouldn't. There, there was just an inability for the banking system to have people on hand to explain those kinds of things unless and until I was ready to present paperwork and I was ready to get into the process. But you also don't want to get into the process not knowing what your status is. You don't want to get into the process and then be unsuccessful. For but besides um, just the, the narrowness of the market and the opaqueness, I think that there is a growing need for um, more people in the space and more players in the space. So we've seen, for instance, a prol proliferation um, of what I call uh, mortgage enablers. And this is for both buying and, and building. But a lot of the mortgage enablers are really not um, it, providing as much value into the finance sector. They're more giving us just, here are the comparisons so that you don't have to do the comparative work yourself. And while that's a nice to have, again, it doesn't give you as much information. If we think about some, some platforms that are now becoming um, home loan specialists. So you think so there, there are some um, financial institutions that are becoming home loan specialists, particularly mm -hmm. because they're trying to address this thing about it being such an opaque space um, and trying to provide more information. But where the real innovation lies, I think, is in um, financiers that are looking to help people invest that are not just looking to give people money um, and then don't care what you do with that money afterwards as long as you pay your bond, but are actually thinking about how do we ensure that the person that we're giving money to is able to use this as a live investment. So there are players that are coming up in, um, for instance, in township and rural areas that are helping with the building of back rooms, the building of low-cost um, accommodation, micro-developments. And therein lies so many opportunities to help people invest with that money rather than just have a relationship that says, if we give you money, we hope that you give, give us back. And what happens with, with your journey is irrelevant to us. Um, mm -hmm. Then, of course, you spoke about contractors and we can talk about the property developer as part of that contract chain. And I mean, recently we've seen the blight um, debacle that's come up where developers are not just people building buildings. Developers mm. are thinking through a very long um, lead into that value chain and how they might be able to profit off that value chain for a long time in. So your developer is not just a passive person who builds a building and walks away. They are actually part of, if, especially if you're buying, for instance, in, a, in, in, um, in an estate or if it's commercial property, that developer is actually part of that journey for the long haul. And you need to understand what your relationship is with the developer you don't actually get to see. The, mm. the people who actually construct and the whole construction industry, there are so many um, issues around that industry, around accountability, um, around price, around regulation. And again, there, there are ways in which that can go very wrong, but also ways in which that, that is a gate-kept sector um, when it comes to particularly bigger developments. And then the final thing that I wanted to do um, highlight is maintenance. The maintenance industry in the property sector um, is really important. Those contractors that you're going to have to deal with regularly. And I would say in the sector, they're probably the people who get the least attention um, because we, you know, as, as people who um, invest in property or own property, we hope we never have to see them. But that's a pipe dream. 
And so um, as, as a country, mm. I think we're missing out an opportunity and in investing in that sector and making sure that people who are operating that sector, particularly people who are um, operating in the lower end of the market, are able to get the right kind of qualifications, get the right kind of vetting. Um, th these are people who we are paying money, letting into our homes, um, and, and they're doing things that we, we really can't attest for. When the electrician comes in and he says to you, oh, Sissy, um, it's going to cost you 10,000 Rand because there's these three things in those five places. You can't even interpret what he's saying. It's not like you can say yes or no. <laughs> and it's going to cost mm. you more money to get a second mm. opinion. So there's, there's an opportunity in that sector, again, to regularize it, but also to make it a lot easier to navigate. So those are some of the things that I think are outside of the traditional thought about the agent, the buyer, the seller, the landlord, the tenant. Mm -mm -mm. And, and, and I think we're going to explore more of that. I want us to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll be uh, seeing more of your questions and comments. We want to go to a quick break, see who the potential lucky winner of that 500 rands that is in the uh, so that they're able to claim that cash before the show ends. Let's see who this evening's lucky winner is. evening's lucky winner of that 500 rands in cash uh, that is in the money bag if you are indeed watching us make sure that you drop us a message down here below uh, in order to claim your prize so innocent apiwe uh, that cash is up for grabs and it's all yours we want to see if you are indeed watching us this evening and talking about people watching us this evening i see we've got a new member in the family uh utabi so utabi on facebook saying hello everyone it's my first time here uh let's give utabi so great uh, you know private property family welcome i know that many people absolutely love embracing uh, new members of the family Tabi. so we do hope that you're going to enjoy your stay with us uh, we're here every single evening at 7 p.m tackling uh, various property issues uh, then i think one of the big things of course this evening that we are tackling is the ways to improve the property sector value chain and really getting a good sense of some of the different players uh, some of the bottlenecks within the value chain and then how do we go about uh, slowly improving them and and I'm joined by Tessa Dooms, who's a director at Jasoro Consulting. Uh, and, you know, I think before the break, Tessa, we, you know, we covered so well the, the various players and the opportunities to not just better them, but also better the, the, the end product that we as consumers get. Because I think we, we all already know that fundamentally, almost every stage, regardless of which uh, you know, sector you're in, there is a service that's being provided, but we're almost sometimes not looking at property from a holistic perspective and being able to walk that journey with a consumer and saying, how can we make different steps um, of your property journey uh, as, as best as possible or certainly as, as, as easy and pain-free um, as possible. When we then, you know, sort of change gears a bit, so getting a good sense of what the challenges are, how can we then go about making those improve improvements and making sure that, uh, you know, things are slightly more efficient uh, within the value chain holistically? Yeah, I'm going to mention two, and I'm going to start with one that is um, a bit more top of mind for everyone. And that's the question of relationships within the sector. Um, a lot of times what gives us comfort as consumers in the sector is referrals. The idea that the first person who we have contact with, for instance, the bank, um, is the one that helps us and refers us to a next player in the step, or the estate agent um, becomes the next person who refers us to somebody else, and that gives us comfort. And I'd like to call that cold comfort. It's cold comfort because your, your experience mm. is very limited. And a lot of what's happening in the sector is that relationships are based on proximity, they're based on status, they're based on a lot of things that may not be quality. And so we do need a lot more of um, kind of objective arbiters and ways that the consumer can become part of the vetting process for who's, who they're dealing with 
and who they're engaging with. So um, when you're thinking about who your, um, your attorneys are going to be, right now, most people are, get given attorneys, get stuck with attorneys um, without having any of choice, any way of betting that because there's a relationship between the, um, the real estate company and that particular, that particular firm. That relationship may make it easier for those players to interact with each other, but it may not necessarily provide the best customer experience. And we've taken away a lot of the agency from the customer to be able to choose. And so we need platforms, we need to use tech better, we need government regulation that opens up the ability for the consumer to have much better understanding of what quality looks like in the space, what is a good versus a bad um, interlocutor to be dealing with, and then to be able to do comparisons that the customer themselves can, can um, engage with. And then um, the second one is, I think, a little bit more tricky um, to deal with. But it, it's, it's really a question about how, how the space opens up and becomes more inclusive and how it becomes less about a big money industry. Because right now in South Africa, particularly, property is a big money game. And so um, there are a lot of people who are, are engaging informally in the property sector in this country, because at a certain threshold, that's when um, the institutions start looking at you as legitimate. And that needs to be changed, that needs to be altered, and it will be altered in two ways. It will be altered by big institutions um, being more innovative about seeing customers that have incomes below a particular threshold, that have uh, precarious incomes, um, that don't fit the model secure client and finding ways to bring those clients in, but also getting more people who are contractors, who are um, um, offering services in the space, who come in at the lower range in the lower income um, brackets so that you can have micro developers as opposed to the big developers in the space. You can have micro financing that is secure and reliable and, and works for you. You can have rental um, agreements and rental spaces that is lower income, but is as um, as professional as secure um, for the consumer as the higher income is. And and I mean, one of the examples that I recently um, came across, just in terms of this inclusivity idea, was if somebody is going to be a renter, the idea of how much it requires from that person um, in order to prove that they are legitimate and they will be able to pay. Number one is varied. So from one um, agent to another, there are different things that you're going to be, need to present, um, but it's also very subjective. And so as a, as a consumer, there's so little control that you have in that space and um, proving your income and proving things in ways that may be completely subjective and based on things that have nothing to do actually with the transaction. Things like race, things like gender, things like class are playing a role in the sector still because there's so, so much subjectivity around who's included and who's excluded. And those are the kind of things that we can, I think, um, take into other parts of the sector um, as well. But I think there needs to be a more inclusive, um, you know, look at the sector. How do we bring people in so that we open up who can participate in the market, but we also um, open up in terms of regulation so that people are not discriminated against unfairly. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Tessa, you, you were mentioning how currently as it is, you know, property is a big money, uh, you know, sector. And, and, and I'm keen to hear from you what kind of changes uh, we can put in place in the value chain that can, you know, on the one hand, increase revenue, because the reality is, you know, businesses are there to make money and make a profit. You say, I think it's one of those things where sometimes the barrier of entry can be very high. Uh, we know that there are different players who sort of play at different relatively smaller levels. So how can we almost go about, you know, increasing revenue, but lower the cost, particularly to the consumer? Yeah, um, I, I used the phrase the other day about mainstreaming the marginal. Um, our country gets very fixated on the parts of our industries and our sectors that are most formalized. And our idea of growing and developing a sector is that we must get everybody up to a certain level. And that level in, is still determined a lot by a certain income level and a certain cost. 
And for me, it's about flipping it over. It's about making the things that are happening at lower thresholds of income, that are happening in areas that are not um, seen right now as suitable, the most suitable for, the, for, for property, um, the priority, and really seeing how we start to work in those areas, work with those income groups. And I, I often think about banks, and I, I've had conversations with home loan departments of banks saying to them, um, you're missing out on a lot of people who could be bringing a lot of money into your bank because you're not being creative and innovative about inclusivity. You're not thinking about how you're housing the nation. You're thinking about a very um, old model of how you actually get um, people in. And there are models around the world that are becoming more inclusive um, and are not as onerous. I think one of the things that I've, um, I've been hopping on and I've seen in other African countries is making the, the time period that people pay for the, the either home loans for buying or for, for building shorter. You know, rethinking the ways in which interest yeah, um, is, is calculated and how all of that evolves. Um, rethinking um, even the, the kind of the costs, the unseen costs and how those are regulated. Again, right now, it's sight unseen for the consumer. So I think there are certainly ways that we can look at models around the world, low cost income uh, models in various European and, um, countries and, and in America have a lot of promise and opportunity for us to think differently about who gets included in the space. And I think that that would um, go a long way. But I think, again, going back to the, the earlier issue around knowledge, for me, one of the lowest hanging fruits in the space is the space that you guys are trying to fill, which is this knowledge gap. And um, I've been working with a, a small um, financier and trying to just map out one business that's in the sector and make it a simpler process for somebody to engage. And so that they have sight of the entire value chain just in one business. Um, it can be very complicated. And so we do need knowledge brokers in the space that are almost agnostic to the business. Somebody needs to be kind of the consultant of the property industry. Somebody who's here to teach, to provide information um, that, that doesn't have a horse in your property um, race, right? So they don't have, if you buy X, then I get Y. There needs to be somebody who's more neutral than that so that you don't feel like you're getting pushed in different directions. But the knowledge gaps are way too big across the sector. And as people pass through and go through different interlocutors, they almost need mentorship. They almost need somebody who, whose sole interest is to provide you with the best possible experience and take you through the chain. And I think we, we, there are platforms that are really primed for it and it could, um, it could work really well to shift in that direction, but we definitely need a knowledge um, shift in the sector so that people can have sight of the full process and can take their agency back in making informed choices rather than forced choices based on circumstance and finances. Yeah, Tessa, before we the, the before we close off the Tessa, I think what would you say is the benefit uh, to property investors, particularly and even property managers, uh, for them to have a really fundamental understanding of uh, you know the way the importance first of understanding the you know the value chain where they are in the value chain. Uh, and of course, how the value, the property value chain, you know, effectively works. Because I think more often than not, uh, certain as certain parts of the value chain sort of work in in silos. Some know we're going to work together, but they kind of like bundle themselves up, right? Uh, rarely do you actually find, for example, property investors who have you know, fundamental sight of the value chain holistically and, and then how why it's important for them to, to know it and understand the workings. You know, what would you say are the key reasons why those players, the, the investors and the property managers, why they should uh, have a, a fundamental understanding of uh, you know, the value chain and its key workings? Yeah, I, I would say everybody who works in the, the, the space must understand the value chain end to end and um, must be able to communicate that to people who are coming to engage the property sector. Like I said, 
these kind of once or twice in a lifetime type of consumers. And that might seem counterintuitive in that it's a lot more work than you need. If you're just the agent, I just need to understand what I need to do, what I need to deliver to this client and the next person uh, after me and then the one before me, and then I'm done. But then you've put somebody into a property that was badly constructed, or you put somebody into a property where that's being um, poorly managed. Um, The end result of that is less people engage the space regularly. Less people also grow their portfolios in the space because it just feels too cumbersome as a consumer if you feel like you're going to be ripped off, if you feel like you're not being given information. Um, And so the better the customer experience is all the way through the value chain, the more everybody wins. Um, Mm -hmm. Even when we think about kind of, you know, opening up an inclusion in the lower income markets. Um, I always find it weird that people seem to think, you know, that's that's a risk and we don't want to take that risk. Um, surely all businesses operate on the basis that you want more clients rather than less clients. And so doing the work that opens a bottleneck somewhere else that brings in lower income clients has a benefit again for everybody in the chain. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it may require adjustment, it may require innovation, but when has an industry ever failed because it innovated? And I, I want to challenge the property um, sector in South Africa, particularly to ask themselves, when last have we fundamentally innovative um, or um, brought innovation into the, the sector? And why is there kind of a hesitance around that, that innovation? You know, where does that reluctance come from? Because ultimately you want more customers, you want more consumers, and there are too many people who are gun shy about the property sectors. Too many people who are renting when they could buy. <laughs> it just, like people were just like, I will stay in the renter thing for the rest of my oh, life. Who buy, who buy at the wrong amount uh, and oh, some who end yeah. up buying a second or third property uh, overpaying. Uh, and, and I think some who go into property investing uh, not knowing what they're doing, end up losing quite a, a lot of money uh, where they had the appetite for it. But the, as you say, you know, the knowledge wasn't quite there and there wasn't uh, a clear enough uh, path certainly to, to help them along the way. So they had the temperament, they had the energy. And I think we, we sometimes don't think about the, the, the knock-on effect of, you know, especially the smaller landlords, right? The knock-on effect of, when the smaller landlords are actually able to run, and we'll call them the businesses because we know that you must run that property like a business, mm-hmm. the, the, the positive knock-on effect when they get it right, you know, because the reality is you're paying your bond on time, you're paying rates and taxes on time, you're paying levies on time. Those levies are paying for other services. You're getting a contractor in that you're paying on time. So there really is, you know, positive uh, you know, ripple effect when even the property investors get it right. It isn't just a the landlord gets a, a lot of money in you know in their bank. So I think understanding then the value that uh, a successful small scale property entrepreneur how they also sort of bring about um, bigger value. Tessa, before I, I, I let you go, you know, I think any final insight when it comes to the ways that we can improve uh, the the property sector value chain before we close off. Yeah, you said a, a word that I'm really, really excited about, which is property entrepreneurship. And I think in a country where we need entrepreneurship in order to get us to the next phase of our growth and development, property entrepreneurship needs to become a viable option um, for people. And um, working in the sector is one thing, but being an entrepreneur in the sector is a completely different thing. Yeah. I mean, just the idea of being a landlord, people don't talk about it as entrepreneurship. And so they don't treat it like entrepreneurship. They, you know, they, this, this kind of, I'm going to be a landlord, but I'm going to hire company X to do this on my behalf because, you know, I'm not inclined that way. I think we need to just break that. We need to break the idea that this is not a space for entrepreneurship, not, of course, only in the buying and selling and renting space, but again, across the value chain, in the maintenance space, there's some property entrepreneurship that needs to happen in that space. In the construction space, property entrepreneurship must be encouraged. The way in which, for instance, government tenders and big contractors um, are given up needs to be about looking at who's the entrepreneurs and people coming up in the space and not only you know the big guys that we've known all the time. Um, in the financing sector, there are property entrepreneurs in that sector. Um, I want to see more property entrepreneurship because I think it will, again, 
benefit the entire value chain, and ultimately the customer gets a better experience. The more choice they have, and the more people they have that are motivated in the space to actually compete for giving the customer um, a good experience. Mm. Tess, I think that's a great place to leave it at this evening. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you for having me. And that is Tessa Dooms, who's a director at Jasoro Consulting, wrapping up the Tuesday edition of the Private Property Podcast with myself, Uzamantumwa Kumalo. Unfortunately, Innocent Apiwe did not uh, claim that 500 rand, so we're having a rollover. So tomorrow evening, it's going to be 1,000 rands that is in the money bag. Well, it's my time to sign off from Balino, who is going to be bringing you the Farming Podcast at 8 p.m. I'll be back on your screens tomorrow at 7 p.m. Until then, hope you're staying home and staying safe.